get made their way into the room, please do so. And I mean that for the online audience as well, or the online participants as well, because we're, there's no audience here. We're all supposed to be engaged, as the director of ceremonies has said. Um, I think I'm speaking out of turn. <laughs> as well as Zoe, uh, we took a deep dive into media viability. And now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the next session. We already have the panelists here on stage. Um, our next session will take a closer look at the future of journalism education in Africa. Last year, the Writers Institute reported on how journalism training is changing and flourishing in sub-Saharan Africa. It is noted that nonprofit organizations and universities are shaping the future of journalism on the continent by focusing on new priorities. Reuters was in fact referring to a study undertaken by Fojo Media Institute and Wits Journalism Department who attempted to map journalism training centers in Sub-Saharan Africa. The NMT featured prominently in the study as an example of a nonprofit organization that invests substantial resources into journalism training. Today, we have the opportunity to discuss this issue in more detail and from different perspectives. Please welcome our panelists for this session. We have Dr. Philip Santos, who is a senior lecturer at the Namibia University of Science and Technology, NUST. He holds a PhD in journalism and media studies from Rhodes University. His research interests are in the areas of political communication, mediated social memory, mediated discourses on conflict, identity, justice, gender and development, decolonial theory and modernism, as well as the sociology of digital mediation in contemporary society. Please welcome Dr. Philip Santos. All right, before we do that, let me just interrupt you there. Dr. Philip Santos is not here. In the room. In the room. Will uh, Dr. Santos be joining us? Hopefully, he's just coming off another uh, Zoom call, um, and he has the link, and hopefully he will be able to join us online. All right. So just to clarify that, in, in case any of you confuse me for Dr. Santos. Yeah. <laughs> we also have Professor Franz Creer, who is the head of the Wits University Department of Journalism. He has decades of experience in professional journalism, having worked in print and broadcasting in South Africa, Namibia, and the United Kingdom at media groups ranging from the BBC and London Guardian to East London's Daily Dispatch and the Windhoek Advertiser. He has edited the website www.journalism.co.za, served as ombud for the Mail and Guardian, and spent 10 years on the SA Press Appeals Panel. His book, Black, White, and Gray, Journalism Ethics in South Africa and the Radio Journalism Toolkit are widely used as prescribed texts at several colleges and universities in South Africa and abroad. Incidentally, Professor Creer is spearheading the establishment of an African Educators Network to bring together journalism academics from the continent to a forum where they will exchange information as well as experiences and research. Please give Professor Creer a warm round of applause. <laughs> and facilitating this discussion is Mr. Federico Lynx, a research fellow of the Institute for Public Policy Research and Free Expression Advocate. Mr. Lynx has written extensively on media and good governance and is the foremost commentator on a digital rights in Namibia. Lynx is also the chairperson of the Action Namibia Coalition, the civil society network central to the development and passing of Namibia's access to information law. Please welcome Rodrigo oh, Lynx. Yeah. That sounds very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And last but not least, and who needs no other introduction, is Miss Zoe Titus. Please give her a warm round of applause. All right. Please engage as the session on the future of journalism, education, and training in Africa commences. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, yeah, I think we, uh, um, everybody can hear us um, all right online. I'm assuming that is the case. All right, um, thank you very much. So this session um, that we will be looking at is the, you know, a round table of media educators um, on the future of journalism education and training in Africa. Um, and this is a, a very um, opportune discussion and a very timeless discussion at this point in time. But before we uh, go into the future, journalism training and education, um, education and training, um, it is perhaps necessary to look at the present and the past um, and why journalism education of the past and the present no longer seems to be um, or has uh, diminished in relevance um, because that's what the, our, the title of our session seems to to intimate. Um, and perhaps to start us off, um, I, I just like to sketch a situation or situations. So last week I was, I attended the uh, Africa Facts Summit in Nairobi, Kenya, um, and I moderated uh, some discussions there. Um, and panel after panel at the Africa Facts Summit talked about the crisis of truth and accuracy in journalism. Um, how journalistic practice has lost touch with the basics um, and how accuracy no longer seems to be a, a core pillar of journalism on this continent. And this is, this is something that has come out of research um, around mis and disinformation on the continent. It's something that comes out of uh, perceptions of, of journalists and journalism um, as, uh, uh, as Afrobarometer indicates, um, where in, in Namibia, for instance, journalists are less trusted than politicians when it comes to telling the truth. This is from round eight of Afrobarometer, which was released in, in 2021. Round nine has just been released uh, this year, um, in September this year, and, and uh, indicates that um, the decline in trust in, in journalists and journalism is just continuing. So there's a crisis of credibility and trust. And credibility and trust cannot be removed or, or ignored in discussions around media viability. Because if there's no credibility and 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 uh, media audiences do not trust journalists or journalism or the practice, then there can be no viability because nobody's going to engage with media products, with journalistic products, um, because they do not trust them. And increasingly, we see from Afrobarometer, more and more people are looking for their news elsewhere and do not engage with news media um, at all. This is, a, this is a growing trend, and it feeds into the trend of, uh, of declining and deteriorating trust and credibility. That is um, a very threatening perception out there uh, amongst the public. Now, in terms of, when, when in, in this specific session, I would like us to do a deep dive into why that is. Why are we facing this? the deterioration in trust and credibility and what are media educators what have we done up to this point and what do we need to go on what do we need to do going further and um, I think our panelists are uh, very equipped to try and address these issues of course we can't delve into these issues in any sort of great depth um, but there is a lot of literature out there on these issues that you can read up on um, and, and take a look at. Um, but we'll, we'll sort of try and spotlight the, the salient 
issues in this credibility and, and trust crisis that faces journalism um, in, in our part of the world uh, on the African continent. Um, and just to add that since the first Africa Fact Summit, the number of fact checkers has increased on the continent in response to the crisis in, 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 in credibility and, and, and trust. The number of fact checkers has exploded and continues to explode because of this gap that, that is being left by journalists abandoning, abandoning in, in many parts of the continent the central pillar of accuracy in reporting and conveying the information um, in the interest of the public. So to start us off, I think we will start with uh, Ms. Titus and, and just speak to, um, you know, what exactly, how do you, you know, see this issue of, of crisis and trust and how it ties in, uh, of, of credibility and trust and how it ties in with media to viability? Okay. Um, you're probably not going to like what I've got to say, Federico, because I know that you are very involved in fact-checking. Um, I think that fact-checking is a very fundamental and central process to journalism on a daily basis. Um, and I think that people still go, especially to legacy media, um, to verify news and information, and especially in this instance, print. Mm. Um, I, I know that the Afrobarometer that you are referring to, uh, the eighth round, which at the same time um, also placed emphasis on the parallel uh, trust deficit in public institutions. Mm. Um, so, so there is a link there. Uh, and I think that um, a lot of that data came from uh, populations and young, young populations who are turning their backs generally um, on um, public institutions, legacy institutions, like the media mm. included, um, because they don't feel that they are represented there. Um, this is uh, uh, related to many issues like um, representation, voice, um, service delivery. Uh, so, so that is, you know, um, part of that discussion. In addition to that, um, that particular round um, of the Afrobarometer also pointed out, by the way, that um, whilst related to this trust deficit, whilst um, populations or the respondents um, were more keen for governments to regulate media. Uh, at the same time, they did not want to be regulated online. So, I mean, there are these, you know, contradictions also, um, because at the end of the day, uh, the media itself is but a small part or portion or provides a small part or portion, or portion of the information disseminated on, you know, social media platforms. It's not journalists who do that. It is the broader public who is most responsible for sharing and uh, promoting misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. And it's unfortunate, however, um, that the media is at the receiving end um, of the scenario. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's just my... Uh, initial take yeah. on that. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to leave you there. I'm yeah. Leave your, we, your we answer can, there and, and move on to Dr. Uh, to Professor Kriya um, around um, the the issue of in, in the context of the African um, Journalism Educators Network, how is the issue of uh, this issue of the crisis in, in credibility and trust, how is this being um, addressed or discussed and, and, and looked at? Well, you know, you're asking very big questions, and they're obviously important questions. And there's no, no, there's no doubt that the, that there is a very close connection between trust and viability. As you said, mm -hmm. people will buy products if they trust them. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that Zoe's point um, around the murkiness 
of the information ecosystem is really important. Mm. Um, and I don't want to be seen to be finding excuses, right? And, but I do think we need to do more to unpack how much of the distrust mm. is really earned by journalism mm. and how much of it is simply reflected distrust because people see a lot of rubbish on social media and just assume, well, that's coming from um, from journalism. And, I, and I, I mean that as a serious question. You know, I think we really need to do more to understand um, those kinds of dynamics. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, I think it speaks also to a need to, 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 to rethink the way in which we position ourselves in that mm. information space, yeah. system. Exactly. Um, I mean, Guy made the point earlier that we, you know, we continue to need institutions, and I think that's an important point. Um, how, how do we make it clear to a wider public, this is trustworthy and this is not? Mm. Right? Um, and that's a very fundamental and very and very good point. Um, uh, I also think that we need to be careful to see trends too quickly. You know, I mean, it, I think it's easy to say, "Oh well, in our day everything was wonderful, and now look at the young mm -hmm. generation; mm -hmm. they don't care about facts." Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that that stands up always, mm -hmm. um, and I think particularly. There is a real danger of um, of of importing a trend that is very visible in the global north, mm. where you see local newspapers visibly closing, and assuming that the same applies simply across Africa. Mm. And we do have problems, right? In South Africa, we've seen in Kenya, Nigeria, mm. and other markets, you know, where there is real economic stress, and we've seen closures and job losses. But the crisis of journalism is in in in, in our context is an older crisis. Mm. Mm. The precariousness of being a journalist, the fact that you don't know where your, your money is going to come from, the fact that there are media freedom issues is not due to this new kind of social media world. Mm. It's an older problem. Mm. And I think I totally understand the problem in those terms. I think, um, you know, we're going to be, we may be looking in the wrong direction. I'm not saying it's one thing or the other. I think it's very complicated. Yeah. But to come back to your question about the journalism educators, look, I... I think that there are a lot of implications of this new environment, which includes implications for trust, for viability, for all sorts of things that we need to grapple with as journalism educators. And as a gen, you know, we, we're beginning to discuss those things. Um, and it is about what happens to our graduates, right? Where do they go? Uh, you know, there's the assumption that you train young people and they go and find a job in a newsroom and then that's what they'll do mm -hmm. for the next little while. Um, and that's not always the case. They become freelancers. They move into community media. Um, mm. They move into communications jobs, all sorts of other places. Um, and I think there is a different set of skills that young people need to do that. Um, skills of looking after your own reputation, skills of negotiating a decent price for a freelance piece, you know, all those kinds of things um, that I don't think we really... Um, thought about sufficiently. Um, and I think, finally, um, I think that there's also a need really to think about different target groups, mm. not only the young people who want to become full-time journalists, but other people who may need um, journalistic skills mm. to operate in this new kind of undifferentiated uh, information ecosystem. And mm. A lot of other people want to work there and are working there, and, and I think we have something to offer. Mm. Um, I'd like to say something about universities, but let me just stop there. Yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that because I, I want to... I wanted to add, to yeah. that. sorry, if I may. Yeah, please go yeah. ahead. Um, France, for example, um, I mean, I think that there was, there used to be a very valuable course at Rhodes University. It's a kind of transition course um, for, let's say, someone with an economics background or economics um, um, yeah, qualification who needed the journalistic skills or the journalism skills, um, to, you know, uh, progress in their, um, their, their career. And I think increasingly, um, maybe we need to look at a kind of collaboration there with, in terms of that kind of course and the general media literacy skills that everyone needs. Um, in this kind of uh, ecosystem. I mean, one of the things that we would really love to see 
uh, that media literacy becomes part of our most basic curriculum, you know, mm. starting at grade one or even earlier, mm. um, because this is the kind of environment that toddlers are growing up in, um, and they need to become more critical uh, consumers of media. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's something that uh, also came out of the Africa Fact Summit. Uh, last year. So is Dr. Santos online? Yes, Dr. Santos is online, yeah. Dr. Santos, do you want to uh, step into the discussion at this uh, juncture? Uh, um, uh, morning. Um, what's the, what was the question? Thanks. Excuse me? Uh, he didn't get I didn't quite get your... Did you ask a question? or? Yes. Um, so the question that I started off with was... Um, looking at, uh, it, it's basically about the crisis of credibility and trust that okay. um, that is afflicting uh, not just uh, media in, in the media sector, the journalistic sector yes. in Namibia, but yes. across the continent and just yes. your take on um, this this crisis in uh, of yeah. credibility and trust and how it impacts yeah, viability, journalistic media viability. Okay, uh, very, very. I think it's a, it's a very consequential problem for the media because, um, especially journalistic media. What makes journalistic media valuable to audiences is the is their credibility, if, if one may put it that way. It is their um, um, the, 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 this uh, trust that audiences have in the media to make available information that is useful for them to make life and death decisions in some cases, uh, or consequential decisions in terms of how society is organized. And the moment people start uh, questioning whether or not journalistic media are providing them with the necessary facts that they need to make these decisions, uh, then that relationship um, now becomes uh, heavily compromised uh, the relation between the media and audiences. And once the media uh, loses its audience, I mean, the, the, the which is the very basis on which advertisers would consider whether or not to advertise with with with, with, with the media, uh, then their viability becomes compromised in a, in a very significant way. And regaining trust after losing it. Uh, is much more difficult. Um, uh, so the lo losing that trust is is the easiest thing. One one bad story, one uh, piece of disinformation, one cause for people not to trust the media can destroy uh, whatever um, reputation that media built over years. Uh, if not decades, uh, with huge consequences on the on the sustainability of such media. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Santos. So I'm going to just you know throw it back at our panel here in terms of so how do we concretely and 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 appropriately adequately respond to this um, in terms of training, um, uh, Zoe, in terms of the Namibia Media Trust as a um, as a non-profit organization, um, what are you doing um, to, to completely, con concretely, tangibly respond to this? And then, um, uh, Professor Clear and and Dr. Santos, your uh, so the responses from within um, academia um, to to this crisis. What is happening, and, and, and you know, in in this space? So I've got a PowerPoint um, that I want to refer to. I hate PowerPoints too. So, but uh, it's going to help me get through uh, the, the couple of points that I want to make. So I've got this thing here. There we go. Um, so um, a couple of years back, 2019, 2020, um, the Namibia Media Trust, the NMT, um, undertook a training need assessment um, for Namibian journalists. Um, at that point, um, okay, how does 
Oh, yeah. Up until that point, we were doing workshop-based training, very ad hoc mm -hmm. training, not, you know, a formalized program. Um, but it was based on specific needs mm -hmm. identified by journalists. But, I mean, we really felt that we needed mm -hmm. to consolidate that and to expand our training program because when the trust ventured into that um, based on the consultations with our board of trustees, they really uh, placed journalism training or journalistic training as a prominent uh, objective of the trust. So we thought we wanted to formalize that and uh, through that we established the NXT Next Journalism Hub um, and you can see one of our banners over there uh, for, for the hub. Um, and in order to inform ourselves of the needs of journalism, I mean, we, we have to work from an evidence-based perspective. Uh, we undertook this training needs assessment. Okay. So our goals and objectives, they were to... Um, to get information about the, the level of involvement in training of journalists in the past years, we, we put out a survey um, to identify, thank you, to identify the training needs, uh, regardless then of professional levels um, and uh, the type of media in which journalists worked at the time and their satisfaction with current levels of training, and then also seek recommendations for training priorities. Mm. Um, and we did the survey um, and developed it in such a way that it could potentially be upscaled and used as a tool for, you know, in other countries. So, I mean, it would be, you know, uh, a useful and relevant tool for others interested in this. So uh, this is just some social biographical information, um, you know, of how the, the, you know, of the respondents and, and the age groups. Um, uh, so you can see most of the journalists in Namibia are between 31 and 40 years, mm. um, and then later. So uh, it gives us an indication that we have many more older journalists and um, we are, um, and also still uh, um, many in the 41 to 50 um, age group. And in terms of gender, this is the makeup. Um, I was surprised by this. I thought there were many more women journalists uh, mm. in Namibia, I mean, than the 53% um, that we saw. Um, this is a breakdown of existing qualifications, those with postgrad degrees, um, undergrad uh, and matric level. You can see there that um, most journalists we, at the time had uh, an undergraduate degree um, and um, but postgrad studies are quite important um, for journalists. So um, we asked the question about the skills requirement for employment as a journalist and whether formal education uh, is adequate pr preparation for the current job. And this was the feedback, somewhat adequate. Um, that is a reflection on, you know, how mm -hmm. relevant the training is to, to the skills actually needed in the newsroom. Um, and here, we've asked consistently, you know, what do we really need in terms of training and this is the feedback from the working journalists to the media managers to the editors, the fact that basic news gathering and reporting skills. So, I mean, there's a need for a return to the basics. You, the multimedia skills in the new environment, obviously very important to be uh, able to, to write for different platforms. But at the end of the day, you need the basics, um, the foundational skills. Uh, I mean, this is not... Um, an absolute train smash that affirms, I think, what um, to a great extent what what you know mm. uh, we we've always known that the the basics form the foundation, um, and the very yeah again the very important crucial skills then again for upgrading and training of journalists again the basics. Um, news gathering and reporting, interviewing skills, 
research and just pitching story ideas to, to your editor, I mean the, uh, as you can see from the data. Um, for us, it was very important to understand the kind of formats mm. that journalists wanted. Um, and uh, we were doing a lot of one day or maybe longer workshop based training, um, which is good and, and, and appreciated. I mean, we are very uh, sensitive to the fact that, it, I mean, based on the, you know, the sizes of newsrooms, the shrinking newsrooms, it's very difficult for an editor to release a journalist for an entire week for a training course. Um, but still, face to face training is very important. Uh, we've dabbled with e-learning, um, and COVID has, you know, proven that that e-learning or um, online learning um, is incredibly important. But um, and it's reflected there. But uh, importantly, accredited training journalists want accredited training, mm -hmm. um, and that's probably the major takeaway that we took from this um from 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 this research so uh, we've come up with some recommendations which you can read there um i'm not going to go through that uh by the is way this, somewhere where people can view this yes uh, it is available um it's online and uh, we have uh, your contact details here i assume you've registered we will um just share it with you via email um, or send you a link mm. via uh, WhatsApp to where you can download this study. So the one thing that I think the important thing that we've taken away from this is that issue of accredited training. So we are currently engaging with the NQA National Qualifications Authority, the National Training Authority, in a long protracted process of getting um, accreditation. So the important thing here is that um, we need to know, and based on this research that we've also undertaken, um, it would be pointless for us as a nonprofit to compete with tertiary institutions. Yeah. So um, we are targeting our training at the NQF four, five, and maybe six level. Basic level. At the basics yeah. level. Um, so that if if you want to continue after that certificate um, and move on to you know a, a degree at a tertiary institution, that option is available to you. But the difference here um, and the value add that we present is the fact that um, ours is practically oriented. Um, we are looking to work very closely with media institutions. This journalism is a very practically oriented profession trade. Um, and we have our linkages with a newsroom, with a printing press, um, so and a radio station. So um, this apprenticeship that we are developing is uh, practically oriented um, and that will, I think, prepare you um, to a great extent for the actual practice of journalism. Right. Um, we want to develop it in such a way. Sorry, this is a long yeah, um, We want, want to develop to it in such a way that this would be the preferred or at least initially preferred program feeding into the newsrooms. All right. Thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Kriya. Thanks, um, and thanks for that really interesting um, overview of, of your results here in Namibia. Um, let me first say that I, I, I think it's useful for us to think about different kinds of institutions, offering different kinds of things, and playing to their strengths. Yes. I, mean, I, think, I think it was Peter Desilers who earlier said, universities can be very, really inflexible. Um, and it's absolutely true, right? I mean that sort of nimbleness that 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 an organisation like an MT can can display is really hard for universities. Um, I think universities also have strengths. You know? For sure. I mean, I think universities have the strengths of offering the kind of accreditation that young people and their parents mm. remember. Parents are big, big yeah. players mm. in this. 
want, right? Mm. Um, I think universities can also, when they do things well, offer a kind of critical thinking, which goes beyond just the hard skills of mm -hmm. operating a camera and so on. And I think that has a real value. Um, but I think, as I say, I think we, we need to, in a sense, look at a landscape and see who can do different things and, 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 um, it's, it's like an ecosystem of, of, of training mm -hmm. providers. In fact, the, the, the mapping study that you referenced earlier, or that was referenced earlier, you know, makes that point. I mean, at WITS, we've always wanted to, to combine practical training as well with critical thinking. So our students produce, they are, there is a radio station, there is a weekly newspaper, there, you know, there are all these things. We have strong connections into, into industry. Um, um, we also have programs that are directed at working journalists, um, you know, for degrees as well as for, for short course certificates around particular skill areas. But I want to, 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 to come back to your initial question by asking a question. And it is this. I, we tend to, to conflate journalism and, and communication. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because when, you, when you're teaching communications, I mean, I, and this is not a judgment, right? I mean, you know, communicators do really useful and worthwhile, worthwhile work. But it is strategic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's often called strategic communication. Mm -hmm. You're going into a company to tell that company's story. And to me, that's fundamentally different mm -hmm. to journalism. Um, and I wonder whether the, the route, to come back to your point about trust, is to draw that line more sharply, yes. to say, we're teaching journalism and it's about values. You know, you talk a lot about skills, right? Journalism is about values. Yes. It's about serving a public interest. And it is in that sense distinct. It's something different. It's... I, I don't want to pose that to, as too hard a question. I would be really interested particularly the students here, you know, to, to weigh in on that. Because, of course, the benefit of getting a journalism slash communications qualification is you're marketable in a much wider market, right? You mm. can go and apply for all these other jobs. Journalism jobs are getting fewer. They're hard to get. Um, so it has that kind of downside. But I would be really interested to, to, you know, to get people's views on whether we should draw that line more sharply. Mm. Yes, I think that is an issue that some yeah. of us on this panel are fully in agreement with that sentiment and, and the, uh, that you pose in that question. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Santos, perhaps you could um, um, address that issue also in your response and where you stand in terms of that question around yeah. um, journalism as just a facet in sort of communication. Um, are you, Dr. Santos, are you there? Yeah. yeah. So if you can hear me. Yeah. So I think the question, if, if I got it correctly, is what um, um, academic institutions doing to address this credibility gap, this uh, challenge of um, trust in the media? What training interventions can be infused to capacitate journalists to compensate for that? I think um, my 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 co-panelists have highlighted some of the key issues. Uh, as always, they've been offered something of a training manual to um, uh, offset some of those challenges. But I think one of the things that we often ignore. Uh, about journalism as the structural factors, uh, which is that journalists, um, uh, despite their intentions as individual professionals, they work in institutionalized frameworks which have their own uh, logics, which logics have a determining effect on how they uh, they will report on issues. So, for instance, uh, something as simple as editorial policy. Uh, on the one hand, uh, and as uh, complex as uh, the networks of funding that a media organization may find itself 
uh, integrated in can can have a huge impact on how it uh, covers issues, what issues it covers, how it covers those issues, and how such uh, practices can shape the relationship between audiences and, and the media. Uh, so <clears throat> I think um, uh, part of the training that um, the journalists themselves need is to understand these, these dynamics, these structural dynamics, and how they translate into their own practice in the field, and how they can, uh, through their own, through the agents that they can claim through their professional uh, commitments, uh, sort of resist um, the way. Uh, structure tends to impose itself on 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 practice uh that's the one point that i thought uh we we need to keep at the back of our minds then the second one um uh would be to 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 reimagine journalism itself to think outside the mainstream operations of course this has been happening both in practice and and also at the level of pedagogy uh, there is a lot of talk around alternative journalisms alternative spaces through which um information key information that is useful for uh, enriching democratic practices and societies can be filtered into the public sphere uh, but also these ch alternative channels tend to face their own risks funding which is the key factor uh we were having a chat with zoe the other day following the closure of new frame uh, which has a very progressive online outfit in south africa uh but which has since uh, uh folded because of um again challenges regard, uh, with regards to funding uh, so that, that that is one thing that uh probably within both within journalism schools and also other spaces where journalism can be uh, reimagined uh, uh it's, it's something that we need to think about how do we create parallel communicative spaces which are not significantly affected by vested interests that tend to have a determining effect on the content that the media creates and which in turn uh, shapes the relationship between the media and audiences. Um, that would be, um, I think, my contribution for now. Right. So, yes. Yeah, um, yes, with, with that, I think we'll open up uh, the floor to the discussion. Um, the floor online and here in the room. Um, Gwen, please go ahead. Just sorry. Okay. Just introduce I'm yourself. Apparently, Gwen and is I just there? I just want to um, please just indicate if you're making a comment or you're asking a question. Um, Frederica, a little bit of both because I do want feedback from the panel. But I think um, sorry, Gwen Lister, everybody. I don't know what I am these days, but veteran <laughs> journalist probably. Um, just to touch on very briefly what Franz said about um, university education in the sense of journalism and communications, the mix. Mm. Um, I've got history with that, and I agree 100% with Franz, going quite a long way back to the uh, when the, what was it called, the academy became the Polytech of Namibia, later the university, mm. but when it was transitioning to Polytech, and later, and also when... Uh, the University of Namibia was starting up. I was on a committee that was looking at this very question of journalism and mass communications and whatever. And I argued very strongly at the time for a dedicated journalism degree, not to confuse it with, with uh, communications. And it seemed as though the donors or the funders at the time were very intent on exactly that. So I didn't get my way and I left those two committees. But I do think that it has caused probably a lot more harm than it has caused good. Not that we haven't turned out some excellent journalists from those two institutions, but there's a lot of confusion um, among the young people who are studying in those areas. And they do confuse public relations with journalism, which are diametrically opposite, yeah. as, as Franz just, just mentioned. Um, the other thing is we talk about the journalism of today. I mean, I remember... a a time decades ago 
when most of us were journalists who had a notebook and a pen. And later they said to us, but you may need to take your camera as well. And we said, but we journalists, we're not photographers. And now in this new media environment and the digital space, journalists are expected to be jack of all trades, put it bluntly. Mm. They've got to write the story, do the story, take the photograph, post to social media, sometimes do a video, do an interview. And I wonder whether in the process we are, we're not losing sight of journalism as a craft um, and that we could also bring in here the topic of artificial intelligence and to what extent that is going to be used in the future in the newsroom to do a lot of those tasks that journalists today are being required to do. But I think we must be very careful going forward to ensure because quality journalism is so important to rebuilding trust that we need to get back to a time when a journalist is a journalist and not a social media influencer or whatever else they're required to be in this day and time. And maybe universities need to structure the courses accordingly. And that's why training now of journalism is happening outside universities and politics, because it's more focused on the business of journalism rather than all these other extraneous things. But it would be nice, I agree with France, to hear if we have any journalism or communication mm. students here to hear what their perspectives are. Yes. I mean, Zoe and I get a lot of young students from both of those institutions wanting help with assignments. And it's very clear they're confused. And that ultimately, when they go into newsrooms, is going to affect the quality mm. of journalism. So it's a question and a comment. Yeah, thank you. And I think there's a criticism in there of <laughs> general, uh, uh, tertiary uh, level you. education of journalists. Yes. So any any yes, there's a there's a question there, and and please let us know if there are any questions online. Um, afternoon, colleagues. My name is Teresa Lucas, and I am currently a journalist at NMH. So this is a bit embarrassing because funny enough, I did study communications and I have a bachelor's degree in communications. So what I realized is that when I got into the newsroom and when writing stories, I was more focused on writing a compelling story and selling a particular narrative than uh, telling facts. To understand. So I was more focused on that. And later on, um, through practice and through more writing, I realized that as a journalist, I need to present facts and not necessarily sell one side of the story or the story that I particularly like. All right. Any any comments or questions online that we need to grapple with? Perhaps we, we can... Uh, Professor Kreber, perhaps you would like to respond to what uh, Gwen uh, said there? I mean, I think we're seeing from roughly the same hymn sheet. I don't think it's exactly the same hymn sheet. Um, because I think, um, I, I don't think it's always tertiary institutions that are at fault and non tertiaries that are getting it right. Because, I mean, I think it's, it's about how you think about what you're teaching. And what is so interesting about, about your contribution, I mean, it, it's, it, what I'm hearing you say is that you, you emerged from a communications degree with technical skills, but what you needed to learn were the values, right? Yeah. The values of journalism. And that's not just, and that's, I suppose, what I would say to the NMT initiative, is it's not just about craft skills. No. It's not just about apprenticeship. It's about understanding what you're doing for society um, and being able to manage your own prejudices and understanding ethical decision, you know, kind of considerations and, 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 right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes with that. Um, and, you know, it's worth remembering that education is not just about skills, it's about values. Mm. It's about values, about attitudes um, and those kinds of things. And, 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 that's an important component that I think wherever we sit in this ecosystem of teaching and skills development, we need to really um, take on board. Yes. Uh, <coughs> microphone, microphone. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Guy Berry. Uh, um, I'm just worried that you, you seem to me to be thinking in an old paradigm. 
that journalism is somehow pure. The reality is journalism is losing because it's pure, because it's boring, because it can't compete with fun, because people don't see it as a product, because journalists don't have social influencer skills. So shouldn't we wake up and try and merge these two, fuse them, without losing the soul of journalism? But you, I just think that you, you're harkening back to an, an industrial model, which is a bit mythical and which is not succeeding today. Mm. Yes, so, what, so, so let me ask Guy, before, before he loses the mic, what then is the soul of journalism that you're thinking of? What is it that we must may, that we must hold on to? Well, I, I think the soul of journalism is aspiration to tell the truth and public interest. And I think you can do That's that. No, but I think Trevor Noah is doing that. No, now, do you call him, do you say he's not a journalist because he, mm. he brings character, personality, he's an expert in marketing? I'd say he's doing journalism. It's not this boring journalism no, uh, that no. we know of. It's not industrial journalism. No, but no, it, no. the guy is very skilled and talented and probably trained <laughs> in how to do all these things. So we have to look at new models like that. Yeah. I'd like to respond to that, but there's a, there's, a there's a question over there. And then we have an online question. Let's deal with the online question first before we get to, to the question here in the room. Yes. Yes, facilitator, we have uh, Anderson Fumulani who would like to make a contribution on a crisis of trust. Uh, Mr. Anderson Fumulani, you may go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Hello to everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to contribute to the, the issue around the crisis of truth, the issue of trust in the media. Um, it reminds me, two years ago, the Mr. Malawi, Mr. Zambia, and Mr. Zimbabwe carried out a study in the three countries and established exactly what the, uh, Zoe was presenting that there was a, a lot of lost trust in the media. And so we quickly developed some modules to conduct some training in the three countries. And unfortunately, uh, it was uh, during the peak of COVID-19. So we used some unorthodox means to enter into Zambia and conducted some two training sessions and, and one in Malawi. But the 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 the... What I discovered, for example, was that it's, it's about going back to the basics of, of journalism because the people who are in the field already um, seem to forget where they're coming from and the things that they learned in the, in the basics time. And you find that when we introduced those things back, it was like they looked so surprised as if these things they have never learned them before. So... It's about sticking to the basics. Uh, while someone is improving their skills, they should not forget the basics, the requirements that you follow when you learn basic journalism, which brings me now to the question of viability and um, yeah, vi vi viability and ability. And, and I think one thing that I hope is going to be discussed is the um, we, we have seen a lot of uh, radio stations being closed down in Malawi um, because they are struggling to subscribe to the regulator authority. And I think one gets the, the impression that perhaps they've lost their, their clients, they've lost their customers because of their credibility and therefore their, their, their viability is, 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 is compromised. Uh, they don't get more business, which means, which brings me back to another aspect to say, uh, apart from looking at the technicalities of producing good journalism, what about the business side of um, making it that this is a business we are into and we are all scrambling for the same market? Um, okay. What is it that we are missing that we are not doing properly about the business of, of journalism practice. Um, that, that's what I wanted to contribute and stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fumalani. <clears throat> so there's a question there. Um, 
So there's a question in the room as well. Um, can we just go to that question? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Franz, Franz Kolik, and I work as a freelance. So I think for me, as the panel are expressing themselves, I was just thinking this question of impact. Maybe one would really consider, if you see society and the issue around social media, whether it's TikTok, WhatsApp, Facebook, YouTube, there's quite a wide interest among society to use such platform. And maybe this is the question in terms of journalism and education, how they are trigger to cap capitalize such audience. And I think that's where the gap is. And this question of viability, if it's not linked to society interest, the question of viability will hit hard media house and, and are close. And I think I'm trying to understand perhaps if panel can react on the question of impact that journalists and journalists in total have to or to play in marketing the thinking of society and create an impact in that credibility. So it's just a question around that. Thank you. All right. I think we've, uh, there's a lot been said there um, in these last few, by these last few commenters and questioners. Um, so uh, would you, the panel, like to respond to, to some of these uh, points and questions? Um, okay, I'll start. I'm just glad Gwen and Guy are sitting on different couches. Yes, uh, it was very obvious that you're on opposite ends of this discussion around uh, the, the models. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that, I think Peter also had a question or a comment. I think it was. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's not a black and white issue. I think we, we need to, to find a middle ground. Um, I deeply appreciate, you know, the, the practical training apprenticeships, um, but I, I fully appreciate also the, the, the rigor of uh, academia. Um, and, and, and these two cross-pollinate each other. Um, and I think if a journalist does, during your, you know, your career, during the course of your career, have the experience of both, it just makes you a better journalist. Mm. Uh, it, it improves your ability to to provide analysis because I think that is one of the things that audiences or readers or uh, listeners or whatever you want to call them want more and more from journalists. They want you to go and do the story to provide um, the information, but they also are expecting a level of analysis from journalists. Um, and that, if you provide good analysis and informed analysis, that is linked very closely with trust mm. and regaining that trust. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure Franz has more to add. Please uh, go ahead. Um, thanks. I I just wanted to pick up on the last point um, briefly. If I'm understanding you correctly, you're asking about um, impact of journalism on social, um, particularly in a social media environment, right? Um, so, I mean, I think you you you're answering your own question in a sense. I, I think it's critical for for social for for journalists these days to understand the environment and to operate within it um, and to use you know whatever platforms there are to achieve as much impact as you possibly can particularly if you're a freelance as i think you said you are um i mean it's it, it's a complicated territory I, mean, I spent 10 years as a freelance before so <laughs> it's a different world um, it is a complicated area, but I think that's um, you know it's certainly important to understand these things and to operate there. Uh, I hope I've addressed to some extent. I mean, maybe other panelists will will pick up um, on this and discuss it further. Um, I just want to say to Guy that I'm I'm I, I'm a, I'm a little bit surprised to be as, as calling for boring. That's journalism. <laughs> 
I didn't think that I, it was something that I was arguing for. Um, I mean, clearly people like Trevor Noah do a kind of journalism. Um, and I mean, we didn't really get into that, but I think one of the really interesting things for journalism institution, I mean, training providers of various kinds to do is to think about the different role players that are doing journalism without being journalists. Uh, and some of it is boring. <laughs> uh, some others of it isn't boring. Um, uh, and to see what kind of, what we can do, and it comes back to my point about quality and about public service, you know, what we can do to improve the quality of that information that's out there. Um, let me stop there. I, I, I wonder whether there's a really, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't know this, but it seems to me that there may be a very interesting side conversation happening in sign. Mm. And it would be really nice if the sign interpreter could just give us some sense of what that discussion is. Just switch on this, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. But yeah, what I was actually saying um, was, um, my name is Beata first and foremost, Armas. What I wanted to actually um, ask was about, for example, um, when we have a journalist now, or maybe uh, when people are using technology or social media, what I wanted to find out was if, for example, <clears throat> you, you, sometimes you see, you read newspaper articles. And uh, so when people are now using these uh, um, newspapers, there are times I think when they don't think about uh, persons with disabilities, because when they advertise positions, for example, sometimes you find that they, they ask you to use all the social media platforms um, for you to apply. And like three, I think last week we were in, in a meeting with you know, people with visual, visual impairment who were complaining that they are their needs are never taken into cognizance when uh, it's really via print media because most of them can't use technology um, to be able to perhaps access the information that is that is placed on social media. And so this, how is how are we thinking about those with visual impairment when we do articles on newspapers like job advertisement? Perhaps maybe what we can do, I don't know whether it's possible for us to incorporate Braille into um, a newspaper or into media uh, work or journalism work for, to, to cater for those with visual impairment. And that's the first point. The other one that I wanted to just add on was in the morning we were discussing about um, how wow. journalists are now Sometimes you need to go to a story and become a videographer. You must also post on social media. So then I just thought of how is that possible? For example, how can someone who has no skills do videography, still post for social media, write in a, a newspaper, I mean a news art, a news article? Because what people are complaining now is that sometimes you find maybe an accident has happened. The family is not even aware that, uh, um, you know, a family member has, was involved in an accident. And then you find, I don't know whether to call them self, I mean, journalists, that are, they will, someone will just take a video or a picture and then uh, disseminate that information without perhaps finding, uh, asking permission from the family members whether they can... Um, send through the info on social media, and then you find family members only find out later what is it, what has transpired because someone that perhaps has um, come across an accident and then they um, started to disseminate the information without um, prior knowledge of family members. Mm -hmm. Just how to work around those things. Are uh, those journalists now called um, self hmm? Citizen journalists, uh -huh. so sometimes I think the commission is, is where we confuse them with uh, now the professional journalist. Also, just maybe an in-point way. I, I need clarity on those two. Yeah, Frederico, mm -hmm. uh, we're uh, yes. 10 minutes into the next session. Maybe we can just have 
one response on that and then move on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Huh? No, I, I think let's, yeah, um, I the questions, like, yeah. the questions, those questions that you asked are very specific questions. And I think there is something on citizen journalism that yes. where it will be addressed and the pitfalls and, and, and shortcomings mm -hmm. and the differences between that and uh, professional journalism. Mm -hmm. um, so you can look forward to that, that, uh, that session. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to, to our panel. Um, Perhaps, Dr. Santos, if, is there something you just wanted to say to end off uh, our panel discussion because we haven't heard from you in a while? Okay, uh, thank you. <coughs> I, um, I heard some of the comments which uh, <laughs> I found interesting. Like, for instance, uh, uh, the idea of emphasizing crafting training, um, it, it's a good idea. I mean, but it also turns journalists into chroniclers of, uh, of, of, of stories, sort of, they just tell things. Uh, and the world we live in today, I think, is so sophisticated that um, mere presentation of facts is no longer enough. There is so much information out there, some of it very complex for an average uh, citizen. Um, much of it needs some degree of interpretation, uh, placement in context. Uh, and the reason why we now have new forms of journalism, such as data journalism and so on, is primarily because uh, there is need for some degree of speciality in dealing with large volumes of information, which an average citizen wouldn't be interested in, let alone understand if they were to deal with the primary uh, data that um, uh, it, it, itself. So journalists need, I mean, there is need for them to be much more sophisticated, not only in terms of um, uh, understanding the craft of presenting stories to the to the audiences, but also understanding the issues that they are talking about uh, and how these issues are integrated into um, uh, the global flaws of um, uh, uh, not just of information itself, but but also of, of, of power, if I may put it that way, how people are, are relate to each other uh, across various matrices of power uh, and things like that. And, and this is very important around topical issues that we are confronted with today, climate change, uh, inequality, uh, racism, and so forth and so forth. Uh, these are not the kinds of stories that can just be told by merely chronicling facts about events that are happening right now, but that need to be understood both in their historical context uh, and it, in their contemporary manifestations in terms of that history uh, and so on and so on. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santos. And I think we'll end it there. Um, as you probably have heard, this is a very complex and sophisticated discussion we're having here about the future of journalism, education, and training. And I think we're still going along, as we're going along, trying to figure out a lot of what um, needs to be done, because the fate of journalism is st something that is still playing out. You know, we don't know where it's going, what's... Uh, you know, what, what the end point is here. Um, so with that said, please do continue being part of these discussions um, and engage in them actively. Um, and um, I'd like to thank you, uh, the panel for, for consenting to be here and be interrogated and, and, and making the valuable points that have been made here. Um, thank you very much. And yes, let's, uh, let's continue the discussions. There's a lot out there that you can read, of course, about everything that has been said here. And I do encourage you to read, um, to be up to date on what's happening in the field of journalism, in the field of journalism training as well. Thank you very much. And Might I yes. just add something? Yes. Uh, I think we probably 
even forgot to tell Bradley that, uh, I mean, this is all being live streamed um, and the entire video of today's proceedings will be edited during the course of the afternoon, the evening, um, and will be on our YouTube page um, early tomorrow morning. So um, you can always go back and refresh uh, your memories about everything that's been discussed here. All right. Thank you very much. That's the end of this discussion. Well, Wait. not the end. I mean, it's, we shall it's just new. move straight into the next session. I think just a, a takeaway from Ms. Titus is that, you know, some of the stuff that have been discussed and the issues, they're not, sorry, they're not black and white issues, but, you know, there needs to be some discussion and, you know, a middle ground on them. Um, moving on, the next panel is called the, or the next discussion is the J Sprint, Viability and Resilience for Journalism Training Providers. Um, media ecologies, or like media, as we've just heard during this discussion, is undergoing a fundamental change. And we saw an actual debate about it here as well. More deeply than ever, uh, DW's Journalism Sprint aims at developing new strategies for training providers to help public interest media to tackle these challenges. Uh, so the experts that will be joining us, this discussion will help us to explore audiences in order to boost engagement, define the organization's unique compet competitive edge, discover strategies, threats, and identifying unused potential, even within crisis, and how to measure success. I think this speaks to some of the stuff that were brought up in the previous discussion, um, I think by France as well, where you were speaking about the different audiences that you get from the different platforms. The next panel is completely online. Eric Albrecht joins us from Germany, and Henok Fente is connecting from Ethiopia. Stephanie Duckstein is also in Germany from which she will moderate this next session. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists for this session. Eric Albrecht is a media trainer and expert on media and journalism education. He works at the DW Academy in Germany from where he is joining us today. DW Academy works in 50 countries around the world to help develop free, diverse and independent media landscapes. Now, also online, please welcome Hanok Fente, who is the executive director of Mercer Media Institute in Ethiopia. Hanok Fente is an Ethiopian-American journalist and educator with 15 years of experience in international reporting, media development, creating and managing youth broadcasters. Mercer Media Institute is a nonprofit media policy think tank which works towards creating vibrant, responsible, and independent media professional unions and education centers through research, capacity building, and institutional support in Africa. The Institute is based in Washington, D.C., and works in sub-Saharan Africa with particular emphasis on Ethiopia. And finally, panel moderator Stephanie Duckstein is a journalist, media trainer, and consultant in the field of international media development she works for DW Academy's Southern Africa Division. Stephanie is exploring ways of how mobile technologies can support knowledge sharing and experiential learning. Please welcome our panelists and moderator for this next session. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Also, thank you to Bradley for throwing the ball to us in the virtual space. Can we quick, quickly get a... a reaction from the virtual audience having a thumbs up and having a hello pushing a bit our representation um good morning once again to our in-person audience also in Wintook and also everyone a hello to everyone who's joining us from the world wide web um 
greetings from DW Academy in Berlin. Um, this is where I am based. I am Stephanie Duckstein, project manager for the DW Academy Southern Africa team. And I have the honor to facilitate the next 60 minutes on the subject, the journalism sprint, a concept for viability and resilience for journalism training providers. So we are going to look at two examples um, of a very hands-on um, way of further education um, and journalism training and how it can survive and strive under the current circumstances. And I think we will touch up on a few things that have been mentioned in our earlier panel, in the panel before. I have two guests with me that have been kindly introduced already. So we have Henok, um, tuned in from Addis Abeba, um, the executive director of Mercer Media Institute. And we have Eric. Eric is a colleague of mine, is a professional journalist, and he's also part of the core team at DW Academy that is developing DW Academy's media and journalism education concept. Very warm welcome. Eric is not based or not situated right now in Germany. He's tuned and he tunes in from um, Asia, from Nepal. So we hope for a stable internet connection. Just a quick logistical note to the audience. So we have a roughly 20 to 30 minutes interview. Um, and after that, we're going to have the Q&A session. So please um, pencil your questions all into the chat. And also for the Windhoek audience, collect your questions and our Windhoek team will attend to it um, in the Q&A session. All right, let's delve into the topic. Um, let me start with you, Hanok. Mercer Media Institute is actually a media policy think tank. So you do research, you do consult politicians, um, you develop press councils. And just lately, you stepped into uh, the field of journalism training. So what was your motivation? What were what was driving you? Hi, Stephanie. Uh, hello, everyone. It's it's good to be with you in this deliberative session. What should be the future of journalism education uh, in Africa and elsewhere? Uh, and I'm here to to share with you our experience in Ethiopia with Mar Marsa Media Institute. So actually, Stephanie, we um, so Marsa Media Institute um, was uh, founded in 2018 because of. Uh, a political opening in Ethiopia that allowed for media civic space uh, to start operating. Uh, so when we started, we had four major pillars, but the most important one at the time was uh, some of the reforms taking place in terms of media regulation, uh, policy shifts uh, that came as a result of the reform process that was initiated in 2018. Uh, one of our other major pillars is, of course, media and journalism education. So we've been actually working in, in, in that regard. In fact, uh, our media and journalism education uh, intervention started with, uh, as most interventions start with a needs assessment of um, what the sector has on, on the demand side, on the supply side. And in 2018, what we found out was uh, there are a number of general, um, what we call cross-media approach trainings where uh, journalists would be uh, taking training at a location. And uh, what we did was, okay, so this is, this is the existing approach. This is the existing structure. How can we do our training interventions uh, differently? And uh, one of the approaches we experimented with was the in-house media training approach uh, where um, media organizations who set up uh, in-house training facilities and dedicate uh, resources for that, we would be working uh, with those organizations. This is just um, to answer your question, I will delve into what worked for us, what didn't, what were the challenges we faced and how we improvise through the process uh, later on. But we, we've been working on media and journalism. Uh, education. 
Thank you, Hanak. And then handing over to to Eric, you had the chance to to work together uh, with Mercer Media with your DW Academy concept, the J Sprint, the Journalism Sprint. Um, as far as I know, it's a very holistic approach. Um, would you could you enlighten us? What what what's your take on this? What's um, what's behind the J Sprint? Yeah, with pleasure. And it was a big pleasure to work together in on this um, with Hanok. Um, so when we started thinking about, no, we, I mean, we started thinking about journalism education a long time ago. And in the last maybe 10 years, we thought of it much more structurally. So we're working with a lot of training providers um, different in different forms from universities still um, or to... I don't know, networks of radio stations or associations that provide trainings for journalists. And we thought what and had a look at what makes them successful. And often it is um, the question of how well they're integrated into the media community and uh, into how well they find ways to cooperate with the media community, with their target groups. And um, the holistic approach is a bit like our media viability approach as well, where the slogan is more than money. And it's more than about than financing your uh, journalistic training programs and finding finances for that. But it's a lot about how you make, you, you assume responsibility for the media uh, system as well and how you can um, find ways to cooperate with in the um, within the media community and be rooted in that as a journalistic training provider because that gives you opportunities to actually um, yeah, constantly innovate your training and work really for the needs of the media organizations and train journalists that are actually yeah, solving those media organizations' problems. Uh, I'd like to show you a, a short model and that, but I just found out that my the second device doesn't have any access to um, sharing presentations. So I don't know if, if no the organizers problem. can do that. Otherwise, we, we'll do that later. We can sort this out. Um, Sebastian, can you allow Eric um, sharing the screen from the second device? It's called Eric, Eric Monitor. That looks already good. Just give us a second and we are proving that the virtual space is giving us, us some challenges, but we take them up. Otherwise, we would also have the alternative um, that your presentation can be shared from Wintook. And maybe why we try that, I can explain a bit how we structured this J sprint. So it's two and a half days offline. We stretched it to five days online in order to make it a little bit lighter. And um, we talk a lot about the challenges of the media ecology, um, which can be addressed by journalism education. We work on a vision of um, the training provider. And then we take a close look at target groups. And when we talk about target groups, we mean the trainees of the training provider, but at the same time also the um, edit or their editors in chief, because it's a question of employability that media outlets and editors really get um, get a direct link to the training provider and have a way of also understanding what's being taught there in order that you can actually make use of the employees' new skills. Um, and that's that's maybe a little bit the structure we do. Um, yeah, maybe we'll leave it like that and I'll come back later then with a couple of pictures as well. All right. Do we have the presentation ready? Eric, can you quickly try to connect with your second device, whether this works? Still deactivated. Okay. Then, oh, here we go. I can see the presentation already. And that comes, I guess, from the Namibia Media Trust. Maybe we use this one, Eric, and yeah, you navigate us through. If you could go to the second slide then. No, that's I a different one. I think that is enough. my... <laughs> so, until they find it, Maybe I can go ahead. 
can talk a little bit. Uh, but meanwhile, if um, if the Namibia Media Trust team finds Eric's uh, slides first, uh, uh, please go ahead. Um, so, <clears throat> by way of um, trying to understand the needs of the the marketplace, when we started our media and journalism uh, uh, training and education um, uh, projects, we went and started talking to influential editors, reporters, and media owners. And, uh, you know, one of the, and this is the key question that's been driving innovation at Marsa Media Institute, and the questions that uh, we've been asking ourselves, uh, how to make our intervention, our trainings relevant. Um, one media executive said, oh, yes, you talk about all this fancy ideas of uh, um, platform-specific storytelling, digital integration of newsrooms, and yes, I believe in that, he said. But how do I pay for it? Show me the money. And that was one very important question uh, in terms of making training providers or journalism education providers relevant to the market needs. Uh, so th this is the very basic question of it's not whether media organizations, media executives um, believe in, in training, but it's making it relevant to their market realities. And since then, uh, we've been experimenting with ideas of, okay, so how can we make uh, journalism training work, uh, and how can we make it uh, relevant to the market needs? Uh, and I say the gold standard for media and journalism education uh, training, whether short-term or long-term trainings, is it has to be relevant enough for someone to pay for it. And that's been the journey that uh, we went through uh, with the J Sprint, uh, the partnership that uh, the organization I work for, Mercer Media Institute, created with uh, Deutsche Welle Academy. So um, one of the um, important undertakings prior to the J Sprint, just to walk you through very briefly the process from uh, Mercer's perspective is to understand um, what kind of training that the Ethiopian media uh, landscape needs, um, not only from institutions, but also individuals who are aspiring to advance their career in journalism, uh, improve uh, their skills from basic to advanced to specialized skills, and also for new entrants, which is a market potential that we've also identified. And uh, some of the uh, findings from a study that we commissioned, we actually did two studies. One is uh, sort of an audit of the training provider models that exist in Ethiopia. I talked about it in my opening earlier, which is the general cross-media approach uh, that most of us know where there's a location, where trainings are taking place. Another one that Marsa Media Institute experimented with was uh, an in-house uh, training provider approach where we would work with a media organization that has the physical space as well as the human resources to host an in-house um, capacity development facility. Um, and in most cases, it could be one or half a person with a, another editorial responsibility. Uh, but uh, we found this structure to be um, uh, cost effective first, because that also plays into the sustainability of this model, uh, because the training space is provided by the media organization where they actually hold editorial discussions, and attendance was at 100% because we have already secured the buy-in of the big boss, the editor-in-chief or the publisher or, or, or the producer of uh, uh, the program. Um, some of the challenges were, especially when it comes to the private media sector, where capacity, especially human resource capacity, is very limited. We can only find... Uh, from two to five reporters who could actually be working uh, with us uh, in this in this uh, training approach. Uh, another uh, important success factor that we thought, even though it was resource intensive, uh, this one was the design of a tailored curriculum that addresses one um, 
professional skills, knowledge, and use of technology of uh, the journalists and the editors in the newsroom. And the second important aspect is uh, the newsroom workflow management side of things. So any training that is outside the context of the workflow of uh, an editorial newsroom uh, would not have a lasting impact because, okay, so you train journalists the minute they go back to their um a newsrooms, if there is no structure workflow that supports that change in attitude, uh, that change in skills and, and knowledge, then it would be uh, difficult to, to, to have a lasting impact. Um, with um, JSprint, uh, so we did the in-house training provider approach for four years now, and we're happy with it. But then we also wanted to challenge ourselves. So is there another model that's out there that could work uh, for the context of uh, media and journalism education training in Ethiopia? And that's how we we, we delved into this, this partnership with uh, Docevela Academy, where our interests also aligned. Um, the, the, the structure of the JSprint in Deutsche Welle Academy's approach is, okay, so how can we find um, the structures that support a viable uh, training provider approach? Uh, it also takes a look at the environment in which that particular uh, training intervention uh, uh, takes place. It also takes a look at uh, target groups, uh, more specifically, some of the competencies that are that are needed that I talked about earlier, and then of course uh, a cooperation um, side. So it's a, a three-tier system: understanding the environment, understanding the target groups, and then creating the cooperation. And then the broad cooperation uh, that could be created with the sector was something that um, Marsa in, uh, Media Institute also wanted to work on. So this partnership was uh, a natural alliance. So and when I'll, we started, I, yes. Before you continue with your on the ground experience, I think that's a good moment. Um, you touched up on the DW Academy approach, the concept. That's a good moment bringing in Eric again and highlighting a bit what's the concept actually you developed, DW Academy, before coming then again back to you, Hanuk, and how was it applied from your side and what worked and what Sorry not? Sorry to interrupt, Stephanie, uh, but Eric should be able to share his presentation now. Uh, thank try. you. Yeah. Yeah, that looks very good. Thank you very much for that. And sorry for not mentioning that earlier. Yeah, and I think so. If you take a look at the media landscape, yeah, and it's not in not so much Hanok's case, but other cases I've worked with. Um, often I've heard this: we are training good journalists, but um, the media landscape has is facing a very dire situation due to COVID, due to other external factors. Advertising revenue was always low, but is even lower now. Um, there's a big polarization in the media landscape. And so that means um, it's not very good or not very, very attractive to be a journalist. And a lot of people, journalism or pro training providers train, end up in the NGO sector and communications. I've heard a bit of the last session that this was also part of the discussion there. So, um, yeah, and so I think this approach at looking at the at the whole market um, holistically actually helps a lot. And there's this one um, graphic by um, Simon Sinek I would like to show you, um, defining which helps define um, yeah like the purpose of journalism education to some extent. So the outer circle is what is quite clear to everyone. We are training journalists. That's why we are training provider for journalism. And the how is also often clear, yeah, which means like how do we do it? In which kind of courses does it is Hanox had in-house or is it not in-house? Um, what are the training um, needs we've identified and what are the topics we, we train journalists in. I think the why is though very, very crucial because the why actually gives this perspective and often found in other contexts, it gave a lot of energy, even if the situation is dying. And I think the why for journalism education is not to train journalists, but is to improve the media landscape, the media holiday. And this, I think, helps 
shifting from we are training journalists to okay, what are we training these journalists for, and what function should they have within um, within this media landscape, and what are the skills direly needed by um, by media outlets in order to yeah in order to to become better, um, become more viable themselves in difficult circumstances. Um, and this is, I think this is the core of the J-Sprint. And this um, starts with looking at um, at challenges, rating them a bit, and then is going on at building a vision out of that and trying to um, work with the... Um, with the challenges that are there and trying yeah, to shift this focus. Maybe that's part of, of the overview. Um, and then from there, once we have this focus, we go into vision building into the look at which target groups have to be addressed in order to solve these problems and to, to assist or uh, at least assist media outlets in solving them. And then, yeah, finding the needs of the target groups, but also the editors in chief in order to create this bond which normally um, you would see in um, in an in-house training as Hanok described very very naturally to create this bond between media outlets and training providers at the same time as well I wanted to take that up the issue of the target group identifying the target group um, for your training institution and I know you deal with um, I give it to to Hanok to you um, I know you were quite intrigued by the methodology of persona so how do you define your target group um, and then specify it would you let us know a bit who I did or how did you identify your target group and how was was it using this method of persona? Yes, uh, this is actually quite fascinating and uh, for us also as an organization, this is the first time uh, we participated in this type of design process, the persona development. Usually when we talk about target groups, we define it either by age, gender, location, and it's this detached sense of understanding your, your target group. What the persona development did for us uh, from a user perspective is it gave us feelings of uh, the various individuals and professionals that we work with, what their hopes are, what their aspirations are, what they say, what they do, what they don't do. Um, so the, we developed four personas um, based on, um, of course, evidence-based data. Um, so we had created sort of what you would call uh, people, uh, on a wall. One of them is called Muruk, a new graduate, which is the Amharic name for a new graduate, 23 years old, aspires to be a journalist. Um, and if you take a look at some of the details of, of this persona development, it really gives you an inset, a range or a number. It's actually a person that we've we've developed and uh, i think the term for that is an empathy map and it really gives you that emotional attachment to the target group that you're talking about uh, the second one we uh, the target group we identified is called um, asha and this is um Abna that uh, would like to advance um, his career, uh, uh, actually make a shift in career from the finance or other fields into into journalism. And it really gives you into the income level of this person, whether their, their marriage status, what they say, what they do, and what they really care about. And uh, we had two more. Another one is Ashagre, a journalist who would like to um, 
transfer or grow in the career in the field of journalism uh, from a reporter to an editor. Uh, so we had all these personas that we had developed and really gave us an inside look into their finances, into their interests, into their aspirations, including their fears, uh, which was which was quite uh, interesting for us from uh, um, a, a project design perspective. Thank you, Hanok. Um, I would like to focus a bit on our core conference topic, viability. So, um, Hanok, when you look at um, the process you went through, what aspect in that J Sprint and also your strategy development you would identify as the most crucial aspect of being resilient as a training provider under these under current circumstances? I think the most crucial um, um, outcome or output of this process uh, was the, the business model development from, from our side. Uh, I've said in the beginning, talking to media uh, leaders in Ethiopia, uh, the viability side of media and journalism training is what worries them. Um, Put yourself in the shoes of an editor, a media manager. Once you hire someone, sending off that person while you have three or four reporters for a training elsewhere for about two weeks uh, or a week, that's not something um, a media organization with limited My end, the internet connection is a bit low. Sources. So I had to think. I've talked about them in terms of lies uh, with the current media market. There are slight interruptions. Oh, I guess this is me. Uh, we're experiencing the same here as well, Stephen. Uh, you can okay. stop this video. Uh, I was temporarily disconnected. But, um, by oh, Hanok, if you just try to reconnect because we are losing um, use, losing your connection and maybe bringing back Eric in the meantime. Um, Eric, I know you have conducted this J sprint not only in Ethiopia, you also went to Europe, to Moldova. So what was the resonance from there? What aspect would you perceive is the most crucial one when it comes to viability to create resilience. What were um, the thoughts of your partner organizations there? Oh, you are muted, Eric. We can't hear you. Yeah, I also had to reconnect because the internet connection was bad here. I think one very important aspect for them was really the shift of looking at market challenges and finding their purpose and their mission in helping to solve these market challenges and assisting media outlets in doing this. This really gave a lot of energy to the media, the journalism school we worked with because they were really like, so Moldova is next to Ukraine, the war situation has affected an already very bad economy uh, that was bad due to COVID and was always very poor. Uh, even worse, um, advertising is very low. And this question of what can we do with that instead of we do such great work, but media outlets don't, aren't able to use this. And so journalists migrate to other, um, other sectors, gave a lot of energy. And I think the personas as well, because the personas help to, to check reality once again. Yeah. And really have a look on the one hand, what do these people really want and how can they participate in journalism education? Because if you, I don't know. If you have young children, you, it might be difficult for you to follow an evening course. There might be another way of doing it in a better way. 
um, but also to identify their pains, um, especially in a professional way. Yeah? If you're a young journalist in a traditional media outlet, maybe your pains are that you have the feeling that not, this media outlet doesn't do anything um, for your target group or for your age group. Um, and you would have ideas of how to change that to some extent. Maybe you don't have the skills and maybe you don't have the support from your editors because you're a junior journalist. And then I think what a lot um, would help them a lot and gave a lot of um, yeah, added to viability and also to motivation in the, in the school was this question, not only doing empathy maps of possible trainees, but also of editors in chief and thinking about how to engage with these editors. Um, in order to, yeah, as I said before, ensure employability of journalists being trained, in order to make sure also the editors know about innovative practices that their employees might have learned um, in the journalism school, and think about new formats, yeah, because it doesn't, like, the solution won't be to train editors-in-chief the same way you train to be journalists. The solution might be, having a brown bag lunch format every once a month um, where you have a short presentation on things. One solution I really liked is having a competition among editors-in-chief for the most innovative um, training course. And the winner's course will be implemented by this journalism school, So, which would be a way of um, yeah, engaging differently with the expectations where, with the training needs the editors see. And there were a couple of other ones as well, um, hackathons and stuff like that. And this came out of there. And I think this um, strengthens viability in the sense that viability is not necessarily the money because yeah, media outlets are quite poor there at the moment, but it is a support from the community and it is support in developing the training program further, but it can also come out of that, that they might um, have experts on this that um can um yeah that that can train maybe part of the pro programs yeah and like come in as trainers maybe for a whole course or for smaller ones watching a bit the time so audience get your questions ready we will come to these in a second um last question for now i wanted to hear from you hanok so so What, what do you plan next? Um, what sounds most promising for you? What are the topics um, you to step into with, with your trainings? Or what, what's your near future plan? Thank you for that. Um, I was disconnected earlier briefly, and I'm back. Um, so in terms of, um, you asked earlier also what, um, what worked for us and, and, and now what's, what's our plan. What really worked for us is now we have a clear vision of where we want to go, having gone through uh, the J Sprint, where we had industry experts who gathered, developed the personas, but then also as an organization, we had to sit down and and define what we want based on what we learned um, on 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 based on some of the research, the evidence, and then of course. Uh, the interviews and the, the co-creative process that we have undertaken with the sector. Uh, now we know our vision uh, is training the next generation of multimedia st storytellers in Ethiopia. And uh, we have um, what we call a business uh, model development. It's actually a one-page graphics design that, uh, that clearly... Um, informs us on what processes to to take. Um, as a training provider, um, Marsa Media Institute um, will be um, focused on digital storytelling, uh, more specifically audiovisual storytelling. We've built um, a studio, and but the most important factor is okay. So, what are we um, offering? that the existing marketplace is not um, uh, is not offering to uh, to the media market. Um, 
we're looking at practical uh, journalism training, job placement also of uh, our um, uh, trainees. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, uh, a studio that we've completed where the practical aspect of actually running this training institute as an editorial department could be implemented. And of course, uh, the trainings have to be tailored to the particular uh, platforms that uh, our trainees um, uh, will be um, working on. Uh, we've also taken a look at the cost structure, uh, how how much uh, the, our training provider concept would would cost, and we've actually commissioned and finalized uh, a market. Uh, assessment and feasibility study. Uh, so now we understand our, our cost structure and how uh, that compares to our potential revenue stream. So in short, uh, through this process of co-creation and, and uh, also evidence-based decisions that we had to make, uh, we have clarity on a, a business model where um, our trainings would be um, offered with some sort of limited tuition for now, and uh, we're working towards how how to sustain that. Do we have an idea of whether this is going to work or, or not? We don't, but at least we have a solid plan, and we're taking actions um, starting next year. We'll be taking... Um, students. Uh, we're going through registration processes also because there are also local due diligences that need to be met. Uh, but we're ready for that and that's where we are. Thank you, Hane Hainok. This is the time. We look at um, the questions you have, dear audience, who you are online. Please raise your hand and quickly introduce yourself and let us know um, what you want to know from the speakers. I do not see any questions so far. Here from the online audience, how about Windhoek? Is there any question coming from the floor, from the audience and Windhoek? Any questions from the same? You have a question? Okay, we've got one question here, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Could you channel into our Zoom meeting? Hi, okay. Hi, <laughs> Tan. Um, my name is Claudius. Um, I am a researcher. I don't have a question, I have more of, I don't know what I have, but let me just say what I, what, what I think I assume I have. Um, the conference is um, the future of journalism education in Southern Africa. I somehow agree with um, Ms. Coins um, saying that she's, she said that um, journalists have lost um, principles, you know, value um, of, of, of being a journalist. And today people, anyone can stand up and be a journalist. Like we have the likes of the MACG. Like I agree with the doctor who, where he said, sorry, where he said, um, Ways so he he, he, um, he referred to Trevor Noah as being somebody who you know who who practices journalism, but he is a comedian. And we have the likes of Alexei Navalny, who has who has um, the Russian activist who has um, six million um, views. And then we have the likes of Jopa Umpanda, who has. Who, who is a political, you know, activist in Namibia, these people in the society are people that are fun, that we assume they share authentic, authentic um, news or facts, and they can be regarded as journalists. 
that's what I I I'm I'm getting here. But what Ms. Gwen said that um okay to the mass media, I I think no 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 wait, I'm lost, I'm lost somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Claudius, do you I, wanna formulate a question to, to either Eric or Hanok? Or do you no, wanna no, make just, a statement? Statement, statement um, to the mess, uh, maybe to, you know, um, get Ms. Gwen's idea in, you know, creating journalists that are very authentic and can, you know, we live in a fourth revolutional system where young people, you know, we are attracted to social media. They can share, they can train young people to be fun and give authentic facts and just attract them. Maybe that way we can have authentic journalists in the future. I don't know whether that makes sense. Thank you, Claudius. Touching a bit on the question, who is actually a journalist? And I'm coming back to the question, whom are we going to train? Um, are there any questions coming from the Wintook floor? Or also online? Oh, yes, please, Bradley. I think that was the only contribution. Do we have any more? That's that's it from here. Can I respond? Oh yes, please, Hanno, go for it. Okay. So I I was also um listening to some of the discussions from the previous uh, panel. Uh I want to talk a little bit about creative destruction. Um every industry um, um, faces new challenges under different circumstances in different time eras. And journalism is facing a digital social challenge. Um, any industry or product that doesn't evolve and respond to some of the new ways of doing things uh, gets extinct. And journalism is not um, particularly exempted of that, if we think about it from the point of view of today's media market. At the end of the day, media is a business. Someone has to pay for content uh, and someone has to generate revenues. And where that content goes, uh, is what's changing. It's not the essence of journalism that's changing. And how that content is packaged and delivered is what's changing. It's not the essence of journalism. That remains a constant. It's the vehicle for delivery of that content and then monetizing based on that content mm. so that we go to work tomorrow to create more content for our audience. So this idea of, okay, so are we diverging from our role as a journalist um, when we actually um, transform ourselves into multimedia storytellers and using the various platforms that exist because of technology? Or are we going to be extinct pretty much like the, the, the role film industry that was replaced by digital screens or, 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 or SD cards. So these are the questions that we ought to be ask, uh, asking ourselves like in terms of what is a viable media space for us to thrive in? Because when we make journalism as a dogma, uh, as a public utility that has to be delivered in uh, platforms that we're used to, I feel like that's a resistance to, to change and uh, those who cannot adapt uh, get extinct and that's the danger that we're facing. And if I can add on that, I think this is also what I meant with um, talking about uh, yeah, media and journalism education taking up the challenges of the media ecology as a whole. Yeah, And with this, situation where digital change is disrupting the industry, maybe media and journalism education can be the one that has a bit more resources and maybe it's the donor funding 
and a bit more time to actually think about what what kind of innovation or like past innovation, think about innovation outside of this hassle of the daily production of media products. Train journalists in it, but also be kind of a, a space where journalists can think about how they want to use innovation, how they want to do journalism differently, maybe in the digital space. And I think for that, this this can be a very important role. For that, you need the cooperation with the media industry. And if I think about competencies journalists need, it's still the basic ones, definitely. And it's still journalism ethics and think about the media's or journalism's role in society. But there's a big cluster on um, which we call technology and innovation. So giving new skills, technologies, and thinking about how to use these skills and um, technology in journalism in the sense of doing journalism for the public and doing public interest journalism that actually gives people a voice and gives people reliable information while still being viable as a media business. And I think there's also one which we call, or like a lot of people call entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journalism, meaning um, empowering journalists to develop new formats, to adapt to new audience needs and yeah think about with even within an existing media outlet how to how to evolve in this times of digital change and i think maybe there's a last cluster of competencies which is about um training like giving journalists also topical training thematic focuses i think this was also in the last um in the last panel to talk about our world is getting more complicated so journalism also needs to be you know, following up on that. And that means having expertise or particular journalists having particular expertise in specific topics, be it climate change, be it social topics, be it anything else. But yeah, having the, the depth of you need in order to provide reliable information to, to journalism that is more than he should said, she said, because those things politicians will do over Twitter anyway. So journalism, in order to provide added value to their audiences, needs to dig deeper and that, that is also important. But generally, this idea of journalism medication as a hub, an incubator for innovation, I think is something I, I think is very vital to journalism medication. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Henok. So what are the future future skills and uh, competencies journalists need to have to provide us with quality journalism? Um, this is what you touched up in, in your last comment. And I want to point the audience to our Padlet again. Um, we're going to share the link again. And there we also ask, what is actually a training you want to see offered in your country? Um, and that will also give us some hints maybe for future trainings we are going to offer, Mercer is going to offer, maybe NMT on site or Misa Malawi are going to offer. Thank you so much. And I'm handing back to, I'm giving back to you, Bradley, or? That is correct. Um, so I think that um, wraps up the discussion for the morning part of this discussion. Um, a lot of innovative thinking, I think, came up and it ties in with how we actually started this morning. Uh, do you remember when, um, when Peter was talking from DW Academy, he was talking about the different institutions and how civil society organizations and training providers and civil society organizations are more maybe flexible to pr provide or to offer certain types of training. And then we also heard from Professor Kruger that there's actually value in what each of these organizations or institutions are providing. And then uh, Stephanie actually, as along with Eric and Henok, guided us through this discussion on the journalism sprint by uh, DW Academy. Uh, so I think with that being said, uh, we can wrap up. We've actually gone through multiple things today. And I see some people are still comprehending some of the things that came up. Probably maybe a good idea for the organizers is maybe just to have like a paper after the conference that looks at some of the ideas that came up. Um, so with that being said, we will take lunch till... Um, 
14.30 Central African time, and we will be back here to continue the discussion. Thank you.